Damon here with NLP Gym, and we are here with Doug O'Brien, who will be teaching Sleight of Mouth July 9th and 10th. And uh, I'm really excited about this because I think we started communicating almost two years ago yeah. when uh, I had this crazy idea of getting you to come here. And uh, you came here for a hypnosis workshop, I think, and we actually got to meet for the first time and we talked a bit. And it's just something that we kept talking about doing and finally it's happening. So I'm really excited about that. Welcome. Thanks. Yeah, I'm excited myself. Cool. All right. Well, let's just jump right in. And for those of the, the people who maybe don't even have any NLP training who are watching this and are interested in persuasion and influence, and then of course, people who do know NLP, um, I find that persuasion and influence is one of those things that's sort of being left out of NLP trainings more and more. Like it's a little too complicated to teach. So they kind of just push it off and hmm. leave it to specialty workshops to teach, uh, unfortunately. And uh, so for me, I guess though, actually, what's that? So that's good for me though, actually, I suppose when you stop and think about it. Yeah. I think if so. everybody else taught it, then I'd be, I wouldn't be teaching my specialty workshops in July. Exactly. <laughs> So um, what are people going to learn when they come to this workshop? And what can they learn in two days? It's amazing what you can learn in two days. A sleight of mouth. I don't know if, since you said that some people might be listening to this who don't know about what NLP is. Um, it's, a, it's a subset, if you will. It's a, it's a portion of NLP that's, I think, particularly interesting because um, NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming, grew out of Richard Bandler and John Grinder modeling experts in other fields. Uh, so they modeled the expertise of Milton Erickson and Virginia Satir and other things, uh, other therapists, other forms of therapy. Robert Diltz applied that same modeling that Bandler and Grinder were doing to other people. Robert Diltz applied it to Bandler and found out how Bandler did persuasion, basically. Bandler was just an amazing guy, one of those guys who just have this, you know, as we say in my country, the gift of the Blarney, you know, this amazing ability to, to persuade, to, you know, to sell a, uh, a refrigerator to an Eskimo kind of thing. He could, he could do any, but anything, you know, it's just amazing. So Robert Diltz kept thinking like, how does he do that? And can I figure that out? Can I, can I model his ability and do that myself? In a sense, that's what sleight of mouth is all about. It's, 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 it's modeling that ability and then taking it on yourself to be as persuasive as Bandler is naturally. Okay. And for those who, I mean, I've gotten to experience Bandler's training and he is extremely persuasive. Persuasive is not somebody you would want to have to negotiate something serious <laughs> with because he is so persuasive. So uh, why don't you talk a little bit more about that? You know, I know you worked with Bandler for a while. I think he even given, gave you an endorsement, which I know he doesn't endorse many people. I'll just say this, you know, I, I've met a lot of people in my day and um, it's been, he's, he's been described as one of the few real geniuses that are walking the planet at the time. And, and I don't know if that's exactly true, but he's certainly one of the closest people to a genius that I've, I've met. Mm -hmm. uh, he's quite really unique and remarkable and, um, he developed this whole field called NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming, not completely by himself, but largely. Um, it was his own just unique stance and perspective on the world that created it. Um, you know, just uh, thinking outside the, you know, very, very far outside the, the nine dots of most people's way of thinking. Um, NLP is remarkable. It looks at the brain as if it's like a computer, which is vastly different from you know, the psychotherapy that came before NLP. And it looks at the brain as if it's like a computer and says, you know, people who, who do act in a certain way, whether it's phobic or whatever, they're not crazy, they're not broken, they're responding perfectly. Their computer's running a program that creates that result. And it's perfect. All we need to do is sort of change the program and get a different result. So, you know, it's a simple concept, really, but it has had remarkable... Uh, expansion of possibilities over the years and particularly in the self-help community and Tony Robbins and all those people have, have glommed onto this and you know made it made it huge and it deserves to be um, it is a it's amazing way of thinking when it comes to persuasion you know you can really unlock the, the beliefs that people have you can really find out you know what is it at the core of that belief that they're holding on to and just make a little change and sometimes that little change is all it really needs to then sort of snowball out and make a vast change along the way. 
So it's a powerful technology. And I've taught it to, oh my goodness, <laughs> almost sorry to admit this, but to lawyers and to salespeople and to politicians. And you, know, you, you see it all the time. But you know, I, I won't claim credit for any of the politicians that are out there. I just, you know, it's like those guys do that, whatever they do on their own. But I have taught it to um, some of their handlers. So uh, it's an interesting ability. Yeah. So let's say somebody's coming into this workshop and they don't have any NLP training. What are they going to be able to do after two days of this training? That is actually one of the great things about sleight of mouth is that although it's usually taught, if it is, I guess maybe not so many places teach it anymore, but if it is taught in the master practitioner level, it's, it's at a sort of higher level, not the practitioner, but the master practitioner level of training in NLP. So it's considered kind of an advanced technique. However, you don't really need to know anything particularly about what you learned in the practitioner level to learn sleight of mouth. Sleight of mouth can stand alone. It's about beliefs. It's about the structure of a belief, how a belief is you know, structured in the brain. And then offers you 14 different ways of you know, conversationally and verbally responding to that belief to, to change the person's way of thinking. So it's like, a sales training, you know, it, it's, it's like, you know, what salesmen do. It's how to, you know, a person comes in with an objection or a thing and they say, well, you should do this instead and buy this product because it's best for you. And they'll go like, wow, yeah, that's great. Thank you so much. I mean, it's, it's not quite like that, but it's, <laughs> it's, uh, it is like, it is that effective for salespeople. And, you know, it's a uh, people in two days can really master these skills of sleight of mouth and then apply it to whatever form of field they're in. You know, I'm a, therapist and a coach and a trainer. So for me, I, I'm not a salesperson. I'm not a politician. I don't use it like that. You know, I use it in my field for helping people, in a sense, buy the notion that there's a different way of living, different way of approaching life. You know, so they have to buy into a different way of thinking when, with the coaching program, et cetera, to expand their business, et cetera. But other people can use the same exact skills that I'm using for therapy, if you will, or coaching. They can apply it to sales. They can apply it to you know, politics, they can apply it to personal relationships, they can apply it to whatever it is that they're looking to be more persuasive in. That sounds wonderful. I'm, uh, I'm, I, I, I use a lot of reframing and I'm familiar with sleight of mouth, but I know that I can really brush up on my skills. And that's when I'm, I, I think people who do have NLP training, um, and I think a lot of people are attracted to NLP because of this idea of being so persuasive and uh, not just for sales, but in, in debates and um, changing people's minds. And that's what I like about the, this model is that it's not about being right, because I can argue really well to be right, um, or I can win the person over to my side. And you can really do either one, I've found, with uh, sleight of mouth. You, you have that option if you want to make somebody look bad, which I don't recommend, or you can actually change people's minds and change people's opinions. Um, do you have any examples of that? that one of the th things that happens with some of my salespeople in the real estate business is that they have customers that come to them that feel like they shouldn't have to pay a commission. Shouldn't have. And so, you know, the salespeople, of course, think, yes, you should, because that's how I make my money. So they have a difference of opinion right away. Um, and of course, you can't, you know, afford to like really piss off your customer because that would be bad for sales as well. So, um, so they've had to learn to be very, you know, politic in how they frame and reframe the, the notion. But one of the best ways they've done it is through basically a, a little storytelling. There's a, one of the sleight of mouth patterns is called the metaphor pattern. And if you can think of a good analogy or story about, you know, your point of view, that sort of takes away the belief of the other person and supports the belief of yours, um, it can be really, really powerful. And you don't have to really argue very much beyond that. If the story is a good one, you know, people go, yeah, I see what you mean. In Santa Cruz. And then this is the book I wrote called The User's Guide. Right. This sleight of mouth. Um, I wrote this because of the way Robert Diltz taught me how to do sleight of mouth in Santa Cruz those years ago. It was just so effective that this was, you know, kind of basically how I teach the seminar. And frankly, I just didn't think anybody else uh, taught it quite the same way that I'd learned it, that I found so effective to have those, you know, those icon representational charts or mind maps, if you will, um, to help 
learn things not just auditorily, but also visually and sort of spatially anchor them and get them into your body. So by the time the seminar's over, they're in you. Right. You, know, they're just, you just got them. That, that, got them in response. that is what really excites me about this workshop because I'll tell you how I learned Slide of Mouth. I learned it about two years ago. Um, I learned it from Robert Diltz. However, uh, master practitioner now versus master practitioner 28 years ago, there's so much more technology. And the truth is, is Robert has created, created so much of that technology that when you go to his trainings, you're just overloaded and he's getting through as much of it as possible. So we didn't spend a lot of time on sleight of mouths. And mm -hmm. I, I bought his book, which I tell people, uh, Robert doesn't write books. He writes encyclopedias. <laughs> and uh, you don't really get to the pattern patterns until the, till the end. And your book and, your, and the, um, the CDs are a wonderful complement to that because it's sort of like, well, okay, here's the encyclopedia, but here's a way that you can jump right into it and start using it right away. And that's what I found. That's why I turned to your book and the, I, I bought the audio too, because um, I was looking for something a little more user friendly that I could jump into. And um, again, um, it, these things, you really have to get into the muscle. You have to really uh, drill it in. And that's basically why I turned to you and asked you to, to come and teach this because I know that you, you spend some time in the, in the workshop really doing that, showing us how to drill it in so that Absolutely. you can think about it. You know, tell you the truth, I, I'm really thrilled to hear you say that because that is exactly why I wrote the book and exactly why I teach the way that I teach. Because I, I love Robert. I, I, I can say nothing bad against the guy. I absolutely love him. I love the way that he teaches. I love the encyclopedias he writes. Um, but part of the reason, and just, just between you and me and a few, <laughs> few people that listen to this, part of the reason I wrote this book is because I bought his book waiting for years for it to come out. When it finally came out, I thought, really? You didn't even put any of those charts in there. You know, the charts that I learned from you, you didn't even put in your book. So I, I felt like I was compelled to write this. I, you know, I, I had to write it. Because, you know, everything that's on those two CDs, that's it. That's the material. I don't teach anything beyond that in the two days of seminar. But we drill it. We get it. We play games with it. We, we you know, have teams and we do tag team things. We, we get it so it's in your body. And I'm a musician. You know, I, I taught piano lessons for years. I, it's not about how good I can be and let me show you how this works. You know, I want my students to be able to play the Beethoven Sonata by the time we're done. You know, not just me show them how to do it and appreciate it or whatever, but I want them to do it. You know, I want my students to walk away feeling like I've mastered this. You know, so that's the whole point of this thing. So it's, it's, it's all about play, playing with the patterns and learning them so that they're ingrained in you and just sort of automatically happen when you hear a belief coming at you from somebody else. Yeah, it's not very persuasive if uh, somebody throws an objection your way and then you go, oh, okay, what's that pattern? <laughs> <laughs> Which I found myself doing right when I, when I initially learned it. Mm -hmm. And when I got your stuff and I started practicing the way that you were saying to practice, it, it just kind of rolled off much easier. And then what you say in the book about, it's not just throwing one pattern out there every once in a while, it's combining these patterns. And yeah. when, you, when you keep reframing the same objection with multiple patterns, it's like the person almost has no choice, but to, in order to understand what you're saying, they have to think about things in a different way. That's great, yeah, very good. <laughs> no, it's, I agree. It is truly a fun seminar. I mean, I. I guess one of the things I took away from Tony Robbins trainings is that, you know, if you make them grueling and boring, people, you know, will not really enjoy them that much and will not take that much away. So, you know, we, we play games. This is a fun, fun shop. It's not so much a workshop. It's a fun shop, but it's, it's really practical. And by the time you're done, they do kind of roll off your tongue. It's kind of amazing. And it, and it's, we always do it so that, the people attending are writing out their own beliefs. So I'm not feeding you scripts. Right. I'm not feeding you. I'm not telling you what to say. It's like I'm teaching jazz really more than I'm teaching classical music. Mm -hmm. So I use the Beethoven Sonata example before. It's more like you're teaching jazz standards or whatever. So people are learning to improvise within the patterns them, their own way. Those things. We'll be spending the seminar writing beliefs that they're hearing in their model of the world or their, you know, real world for them. And they're bringing, bringing, practicing things for that situation so that by the time they're done with the weekend, they're going to hit, hit the ground on Monday morning at their sales job, you know, just on fire. Mm. And I have to say, um, so I, I am in sales and I have used it for sales um, very effectively. 
I think what I enjoyed most though was, was coming up with my own limiting beliefs about whatever, whether it was goals or my own success and running it through these patterns. And you will start to get ideas that you would have never really? thought of because you're, you're, you're pushing yourself to think in different frames. And uh, so informa- you, it's like allowing new information to come in that you weren't getting in before because your generalization was too limited or your belief was too limited. So I found that to be extremely powerful. Yeah, good for you, Grasshopper. That is advanced work right there. Like I said, I'm still looking forward to this. And I've been telling all of my friends, including um, I have a lot of friends who are um, sales professionals who uh, are always asking me, you know, what's this NLP thing that you do? And, and I'm going to them now and saying, you know, this is the perfect workshop for you to really see not only what NLP is about, but how it can, it can really help you in what you do. And uh, I've also found this, um, as we're talking, I keep thinking of all the ways that I've used this. And uh, another one is if you have employees, uh, anybody who, who has employees knows how difficult it can be to uh, motivate them, to get them to do what you need them to do. And they start to get caught in their patterns and they start creating limiting beliefs. You run some sleight of mouth patterns over them and it's, so gentle the way it can come across and really shift their thinking. And that's where you start to become a leader. So in, in, in a lot of ways, you can actually look at what you're going to teach us as leadership training because leaders, are they influence people and that's why they become leaders. I think one of the reasons that's really true is that sleight of mouth starts from listening. You know, so much of sales, you know, the way people teach sales is that, you know, I'm, we're going to teach you what to say. And really, sleight of mouth is about listening first. You have to really listen, really understand what the person is saying, where they're coming from, in order to you know, unpack their beliefs so that you can artfully step in there and guide them to thinking differently. So it's, it's about listening, which is like radical. <laughs> you know, listening to that other person and really understanding where they're coming from. It's about communication, which starts with the word commune, when you commune with people, you have a community, you know, you're, you're matching with them, you're meeting with them. I also start usually when I teach sleight of mouth with a, um, teaching the agreement frame, which isn't technically part of sleight of mouth, but it's a great way to start, which is again, where you're listening to the person and finding where you do agree with what they're saying. So that you can pace and then lead, which is of course a central tenant of NLP and Ericksonian hypnosis. But you know, you pace first and then you lead. So you listen first and then you persuade. NLP Jim talking to Doug O'Brien, who will be here July 9th and 10th, which is a Saturday and Sunday here in Santa Cruz to teach sleight of mouth. One of the, uh, I'd say the, the funnest models that I've ever come across. And mainly, like you've mentioned before, it is modeled after Richard Bandler. And if you've ever seen him in action, uh, you know <laughs> what a character he is. And, uh, charismatic and, and certainly persuasive and, and influential. So uh, this is going to be good stuff. I'm really excited. Me too. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah. All right. Well, see you soon.